put the camera up front so you won't be seen by the folks that'll, that'll catch this vis- version later on, but help yourself. Another word about the service today, it's, as I said, relaxed. I'm going to share a story by a, a Presbyterian minister that I particularly delight in his stories in a bit. But we'll lift up the word. The carols that we'll sing are printed in your bulletin. We're going light on bringing hymn books down and those sorts of things. Um, What else did I want to tell you about today? One last thing. Don't always get a chance to to do this and, and announce this kind of thing, but up here on the pedestal are these special flowers, and they represent the 50th anniversary of Cliff and Sally No. Now, they've got some special plans this week, but let me just say and share that when Susan and I got on the airport shuttle to go to the airport on our honeymoon, the bus driver inquired about our trip and what we were about and got a big old grin on his face and simply said, the best blessing I've ever heard, may you dance on your 50th. Cliff, sometime this week. Sally's expecting it. But anyway, we are glad you're here, and we're glad you're with us in our tape delay service. Welcome, but let us prepare to worship the Lord. Merry Christmas and good morning to you all. Welcome to Chester Presbyterian Church this morning. It's Christmas morning. Now let us call ourselves to worship. Please stand if you're able and respond with me to our call. Christ is born. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus is among us. Hallelujah. Shout with joy. Give thanks and sing. Christ is born. Let us pray. On this day, gracious Lord, you came to us as a word, as light, as flesh. Teach us to know you so well that our lives may befriend this world you have made. In this name of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, amen.
Please be seated. Well, it looks as if a few of you are enjoying a snack, particularly the ones that were in the Christmas cups back there. Did you know this snack has a special meaning? That's right. In these cups is the story of Jesus' birth. Let me tell you how. Good thing I had a couple. Yeah, slippery. Pretzel sticks are slippery. No, pretzel sticks are like the staffs that the shepherds in the fields had when they were caring for their flock. So that's what those pretzels are for. Now, I've got a few mini marshmallows in mine. When Jesus was born, those shepherds out in the field, well, they were taking care of flocks of sheep. And suddenly an angel appeared. Now, we don't really know what angels look like. But most every picture we've ever seen drawn of an angel has a halo. So the Cheerios in the snack will always remind you of the angels that shared Jesus' coming. They announced that good, great news the Savior has been born. Now, one of my favorites from long ago I got to remember by bringing back because the shepherds ran to Bethlehem to see Jesus. And they wanted to see what the angel had told them. And they wanted to find their Savior. And when they did, they found that Jesus was in a manger, which is a place where animals were fed and kept. He was actually lying in a feeding trough with Mary and Joseph by his side. So the king of the universe, in strips of cloth, lying where animals were fed, animal crackers. Make sense? And then because you can't have a good trail mix snack without another little bit of sweet, we have to remember that Mama Mary knew that Her baby was someone special. God had told her who the child was, and she treasured what she knew in her heart. But I think what Mary truly treasured, what especially she held close in her heart, were those first few hours with Jesus because she knew there would come a time when she would not be able to hold him or be with him all the time, that he would be busy with others, that the Messiah of the world would have much to do in the years to come. So that special treasure are those special treasures of M&Ms that remind us of how close baby Jesus was to his mother's heart. Jesus' birth that first Christmas is just the first part, of course, of Jesus' story. He went on to make a way for everyone to know God and to know God's love. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for baby Jesus, born on Christmas for all of us, for all the world. It is indeed a great joy. Amen. Let us pray. Savior God, liberate us, liberate us from the sins which we distort our vision and disrupt our hearing as we approach. As we approach your word, standing firm in your love. Let us open ourselves to the truth you reveal to us today. Our scripture reading today is Luke. This gospel at chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. Now in that same region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone upon them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. 
For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heavens, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see the thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard were amazed at what the shepherds told them. And Mary treasured all these words and pondered them with her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as it had been told to them. Well, as I mentioned that it's been a long tradition for me to share a story. And this year I bring a story by a Presbyterian minister named Arthur Fogarty, who we just missed overlapping in the Presbytery of the Peaks. I left Nelson County just a year or two before Art went to First Presbyterian Lynchburg. And he wrote this during his tenure there. But I invite you to listen and marvel at this wonderful story, Angels We Will Hear on High. The young man bounded into the room like a hyperactive, two-legged Labrador puppy, all feet and energy. His entrance was not theatrical, but certainly memorable. I don't recall his exact dimensions at the time, but his presence seemed enormous. And from the first moment I saw him, I could hear Clement Clark Moore's immortal line ricocheting in my head. A right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. Nothing about the 14-year-old reflected age, except, as I would later learn, his soul. The spirit he carried proved an ancient beyond measure, stemming from somewhere out of an epoch for which we all long, but which few of us ever visit. My name's Shane. Who are you? Never mind, I had on a suit and a tie. Never mind, we were in a pretty serious meeting. All of us saying our beverage, all of us sipping our beverages very properly for fear we might slurp. Never mind the obvious 20 or so years difference in our ages. Maybe it'll Never mind, he'd just wandered in from some athletic or physical endeavor, which obviously involved the presence of a great deal of dirt. My name's Shane, who are you? Not rude, just a very direct question, writing a massive subtext. Since you're in my house with all these people I already know, and since my parents are being nice to you, you must be someone I ought to meet. And from that moment, we were friends. Oh, I wasn't alone. Across the next few years, I found out no one was alone if Shane appeared. At least not for long. Shane found everyone. The nerdy, the Greeks, the geeks, the pimple afflicted, the socially challenged, the person standing dutifully in the corner, assigned there by the popular crowd. 
Shane found them and, if nothing else, pestered them into a relationship. Even if you never spoke, you stood in silence shamelessly accompanied by Shane's hulking shadow. He grew into a strapping young man, a fitting description, strapping, big, raw, and strong as an onion sandwich. Work all day, dance all night, talk until your ears looked for a place to hide. He could hike for miles without complaint, and when the others collapsed at the campsite, he would be out searching for firewood. If after dropping his lure into the lake, he did not receive an immediate nibble, he'd better hang on, because just after the curt announcement, they are not biting here, he'd careen across the lake with a boat at full throttle. It was like fishing with some manic, self-propelled frisbee, a restless bundle of enthusiastic energy pulsating for release. And he could hit a golf ball farther than any human being I've ever seen. Absolutely never hit it straight. If it got air airborne, it seldom kept it on course. Some national defense site undoubtedly picked up a few of his shots on radar as they crossed time zones. But Shane would just drop another, look over and say, really crush that one, huh? And we'd move along. 18 holes and 25 or so balls later, at a point where most players would be looking for some lake into which to submerge their clubs permanently, Shane would find one stroke among his 100 or so over which to rejoice and then spend the rest of the time figuring out when we could play together again. The following should tell you something of his personality. When he was about six or so, his little buddies had a come as your favorite cartoon character party. Dozens of tykes sprang forth as Cinderella, Snow White, Superman, Mickey Mouse, perhaps even a He-Man or two. Shane chose his hero instantly and arrived at the festivities complete with club and faux bearskin suit. And from time to time, or so the story goes, the miniature partygoers froze in solemn and perhaps petrified stillness as the cry soared over the merrymaking, Captain Caveman! Possibly the most revered occupant of Shane's house was Choco, a massive retriever whose sole purpose in life lies in attempting to escape at any and all times. House guests receive significant and frequent warnings regarding the dog's proclivity. And so when I was outside one evening and heard the jingle of Choco's tags and realized he was loose due to my stupidity, how was I supposed to know he could open the screen door? I determined it was my responsibility to recapture him. Off I charged in hot pursuit. At night, in a relatively unknown neighborhood, chasing Choco down streets and through backyards and across basketball courts, barefoot. Choco would pause occasionally, look back as if to say, here I am, old, fat, out of shape, Idaho man. Wait until I was about an arm's length away and then trot off as I lunged. When I lost him in the Stygian gloom, I followed the sound of his collar. Chink, 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 chink. Choco had a great time. I almost had a stroke. I finally corralled the miscreant when he stopped to investigate a fellow canine. I triumphantly looped my belt over his head and around his size 19 neck and headed home. Choco didn't want to go. And when that apparently 300 pound dog sat and growled, I decided it was indeed a lovely evening to sleep under the stars. Actually, I was sort of glad for the rest. City boys like me don't go to the beach without shoes. My feet were on fire. A jeep pulled up and Shane's voice echoed through the darkness. 
Hop in, I'll take you home. And before Shane finished speaking, Choco had nearly dislocated my shoulder, pulling me into his beloved buddy's car. Thanks, Shane. Breath came slowly. Art, that was really stupid. Really nice, but really stupid. Choco always comes home after a while. Of course, if he didn't, I could always say, this is Art. He visited my house, ate my food, and killed my dog. Shane's chuckle welled up from some deep cavern as if a slumbering giant had awakened from a century of sleep and finally caught on to the joke he'd heard a hundred years earlier. According to legend, when he was studying the schematics for the most recent renovations of hell, Satan threw the plans back at the engineers. Not hot enough, he bellowed. But your lordship, this is the best we can do. I don't think so, thundered the Prince of Darkness. I want miserable. I want intolerable. I want stifling. I want Tulsa. The Oklahoma sun beat on us with intentional July malice. The blazing ball refused to relent until we puddled like the Wicked Witch of the West in The Wizard of Oz. I'm melting. I cowered in what little shade I could find. Shane scrubbed away. This van is filthy. He could have washed it with the sweat pouring off his neck. Shane, take it easy, buddy, I cautioned. How'd you get it this dirty? We hit every bug for 1,500 miles, I said. Shane's shoulders bucked up and down. That's a good one, Art. Every bug for 1,500 miles. Four more quarters shot into the slot. Shane punched the wash button again. This ought to do it, he predicted. Then I'll rinse, wax, and polish. You've been scrubbing for 40 minutes, I wheezed. Don't you think it'll be okay? Not going to do a bad job, Art. Your van needs to be clean. You've got a, to travel more, right? Not if you don't mind giving up your bed and sleeping on the couch for the rest of your life. That'd be okay. Can you really stay? Do you think you could? We could play golf tomorrow. Visions of surface-to-air missiles flashed through my mind. We've really got to go, Shane. A brief found, frown. Okay, but this is going to be clean. He disappeared again, and the van wobbled. Every so often, the long-handled brush broke the roof line, spewing bubbles in some demented impersonation of the Lawrence Welk show. Three or four more dollars for the rinse cycle, but Shane got his money worth. I got wet. Gotcha, he shrieked. Jeez, a peach, Shane, knock it off. I tried to sound angry. I'm sorry, Art. Apparently, I was a better actor than I knew. I was just fooling around. You looked awful hot. I took it off jet and put it on spray. Did I hurt you? Shane, it's OK. Just kidding. No problem. Water felt good. Oh, OK. Back at it. That van got scrubbed in places it didn't know it had. Wax, polish, and a brisk rub down with a towel. Shane looked like he'd run the New York City Marathon. OK, buddy, I slid behind the wheel. How much do I owe you? Nothing, Art. Shane, you spent 10 or $15 washing this thing. Only quarters, Art. That's no big deal. I get all Dad's extras. Well, let's head over to the stop and go. What do you want to drink? Nothing. How about an ice cream or a milkshake? No, thanks. The light was red. I turned to look at him. Shane, you've got to let me do something. Art, if you pay me or give me anything, then I haven't done anything for you. I like washing cars. I'm good at it. He paused. Tell you what, I'll make it your Christmas present. We got to Shane's house and he jumped out. But before he went inside, he peered around the bumper. Art, yeah, Merry Christmas. And he bounced indoors, his pockets clinking with the 20 or so extra dollars worth of quarters he would have spent if he needed them. Shane doesn't wash vans anymore. 
on Valentine's Eve, while typically paying more attention to having a good time and to enjoying his companions than to either automotive safety or the speed limit, Shane rolled his Camaro and went to live with God. A tragedy, a waste, but not really a surprise. Shane wasn't foolhardy, one of his relatives said. He just went to heaven the same way he did everything else, fast. If some people hear the beat of a different drummer, Shane marched along with his own personal brass band. I hear his father's calm voice. It's hard this year, our first Christmas since. We keep running into reminders of Christmas's past. Cards, gift tags, favorite presents. But the star still shines and we will follow. We will not substitute gifts for grief. But we have started a little tradition. On a trip to New York last week, I bought an angel for Carolyn. We'll get one every year as a way of remembering our son and of saying thank you for the Christ child. And so the seraphic collecting begins. A new angel appears every year, perhaps a silver-winged archangel or a candle-bearing cherub. No one is exactly sure what will show up, but everyone is confident that whatever arrives will absolutely enhance and enrich life's joys sort of like living with Shane. The angels will come, one by one, year by year, haloed soldiers standing sentinel over the birthplace of Bethlehem's king. Their numbers will increase until, from their vantage point of coffee table or mantle, they will remind every observer of a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace. Regardless of the quantity or appearance of the angelic aggregation, those who look upon the ever-expanding field of wings will actively remember an exuberant young man of limitless zeal and in-your-face affection. And sometime during this and every subsequent blessed winter season, the angels will sing another tune. Perhaps it will sound during the wee hours when shepherds quake and youngsters strain to hear reindeer on the roof. Perhaps only a mother or father or brother will perceive the soothing music. Perhaps the chorus will harmonize so softly the melody will just fall captive to hopeful hearts. Perhaps the new rendition will begin every year when the rookie arri arrival appears from a nest of wrapping paper. But the ever-growing choir that will annually announce the good tidings of great joy will surely also take breath and croon together an anthem of a softer but no less triumphant key. They will join their voices in honor of a gentle giant who embodied the very spirit of Christmas with buoyancy and grace by wearing himself out washing a visitor's van on a day of sunstroke and blisters. Yes, the angels will sing. For to us a child is born, and you shall call his name Shane. Ethan Shane Woodward died on February 14th, 1996. This story is dedicated to the glory of God and to Shane's memory. God bless us, everyone.
please be seated. As we turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer, let us pray for the world in which the Prince of Peace took flesh and form, saying, Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Holy One, for the light that has come down into the darkness of our world, for the truth illuminated, for the pathway that has opened, for the rejoicing of your people. Hear us, O God. We give you thanks for the feet of those who bring good news, friendship, comfort, food, shelter, and medicine for healing. Hear us, O God. We give you thanks for the Church of Christ Jesus and for all people of faith whose attention to the way of peace tears down walls that keep us apart. Hear us, O God. We give you thanks for this country and for every nation where wisdom reigns, where leaders work for the well-being of the poor, so that no one is hungry or homeless, and every child is valued and nourished. Hear us, O God. We pray for the knowledge and courage to be good stewards of all that you have given us, ourselves, our neighbors, the strangers among us, the oceans and rivers, the air and soil, creatures large and small, that we may continue to be blessed with health and life. Hear us, O God. We pray for those whose flesh is harmed by poverty, sickness, and cruelty of any kind, that the Word made flesh may so fill your world with the power to heal, that all people would be made strong and whole. Hear us, O God. We pray for those concerns unvoiced, unnamed this day, yet residing deep in our hearts. Hear us, O God. We commend all these things to you and offer our thanksgiving trusting that what we have left unsaid, your holy wisdom can unearth in the name of the one who came among us in the power of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And thank you to all who have shared so generously throughout the year, who on the way in made an offering or may on the way out. Your generosity, as I've been saying, is what allows the ministries God calls us into to go forth from this corner.
Once more, let us pray. Divine giver, all that we have is a gift from you, and your grace is our sufficiency. Pour out your Spirit upon these gifts, that they may increase your blessing to others. Through the grace and mercy of Christ. Amen. Before we share our last carol, I want to remind everyone that last night the wonderful puppets, particularly at the 5 o'clock service, reminded us that, that Christmas is Jesus' birthday. And that's a wonderful thing, but sometimes it's also the birthday of others. So today, I want to just share with you that I learned last night it's Aria's birthday, wherever... Oh, well, we... But besides Aria, it is Roshan's birthday. Happy birthday, Roshan. And Cliff, if you've come forward and helped me, we have some birthday gifts. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon each and every one of you and grant you his peace, his shalom, and of course, Merry Christmas. <laughs> 